Thirdly, how do you suppose NASA put all that helium-3 into those fake moon rocks? Jared doesn't offer a clue. Dr. David McKay said that we don't have particle accelerators powerful enough to soak rocks with high-energy atomic nuclei to duplicate the effect of millions of years of cosmic ray exposure. This is the section that Webb refers to. The quote in question appears to be from Tony Phillips, the writer of the article, not Dr. McKay. Even if scientists wanted to make something like a moon rock by, say, bombarding an Earth rock with high-energy atomic nuclei, they couldn't. Earth's most powerful particle accelerators can't energize particles to match the most potent cosmic rays, which are themselves accelerated in supernova blast waves and in the violent cores of galaxies. This is technically true, but also irrelevant. While we can't replicate the highest energy cosmic rays found in space, we do have particle accelerators capable of replicating the majority of cosmic ray energies. According to John Malden and Eugene Parker, the majority of cosmic rays that strike the Earth-Moon system have energies ranging between 1 billion electron volts and 10 billion electron volts. Observations near Earth are a poor guide because Earth's weak magnetic field protects us from cosmic particles below about 100 giga electron volts and reduces the intensity by 10 or more up to 10 giga electron volts. Intensity peaks at about 1 giga electron volt, is serious below 10 giga electron volts, and decreases rapidly beyond that. The highest energy particles are so rare that a starship is unlikely to encounter one. The flux is about 10,000 particles per square meter per second, with kinetic energy averaging about 5 giga electron volts, equivalent to about 5 by 10 to the negative 6 joules per square meter per second. Wikipedia has a list of the world's particle accelerators used in particle physics. In their list of synchrotrons, you'll find that there was as many as 7 particle accelerators all capable of charging protons anywhere between 1 GeV and 33 GeV, and they were all in service before, during, or shortly after the Apollo astronauts supposedly returned moon samples. One of these particle accelerators is located in Russia, produces 10 GeV exactly, and is still in service to this day. If we scroll further down to their list of fixed target accelerators, we find many more proton accelerators capable of producing 10 GeV or greater, and again, most of them were all in service during the Apollo era. Additionally, if you want to talk about simulating the solar wind, remember the Zachary Sharp who came to NASA's defense that the moon is bone dry? Guess what he used in his studies? a proton accelerator to specifically simulate solar wind exposure on the moon. This is posted in a news release on the Los Alamos National Laboratory website. Mimicking the moon's surface in the basement. A team of scientists used an ion beam at Los Alamos National Laboratory to simulate solar winds on the surface of the moon. And while direct exposure to atmospheric helium-3 might contaminate the surface of some Earth rocks, there would be no penetration, no helium-3 inside the rocks. So, how did NASA do it? Did they use their magic oven? That seems to be the only plausible explanation. You can spare me your sarcasm. I'm immune. Earlier, you claimed there was very little helium-3 inside the rocks themselves, and that the larger quantities are found on the outside due to the solar wind. And contrary to what you claim, solar wind particles can penetrate as deep as at least 3 millimeters, not 1 micrometer. There would still be plenty of solar wind-induced helium-3 inside the rock once the fusion crust was removed, which incidentally only accounts for the first millimeter into the rock. I'd say that NASA wouldn't need a magic oven, don't you think? Another thing that the propagandists love bashing on and on about is the age of lunar rocks, and Webb peddles it towards the end of his video. This cosmic ray exposure age, which measures the age of newly formed solar isotopes, should not be confused with the age of moon rocks, as determined by radiometric dating, which looks at isotopes that were present when the rock was first crystallized. Using that testing, the youngest moon rocks brought back by Apollo are as old as some of the oldest existing rocks on Earth. 
The diagram that Webb shows indicates that the oldest rocks on Earth are only 3.2 billion years old. But this is incorrect. In fact, as you will see, the oldest Earth rocks are about as old as the Apollo samples. Genesis done! 16-bit arcade graphics. The oldest Apollo sample, dubbed by the press as Genesis Rock, is 4.5 billion years old. The same age as meteorites found on Earth. Remember, as we learned, unlike the chondrites, whose composition Webb tries to apply to meteorites in general, eukrites, howardites and tektites have compositions virtually the same as Apollo samples. The same case with volcanic terrestrial rocks. How old are they? The oldest volcanic deposits discovered are 4.28 billion years old. Close enough. Incidentally, the age of moon rocks was discussed in the BBC clip that I played in Moonfaker Exhibit D. Scott and Irwin had found a piece of rock sparkling with mineral crystals. Okay, let me get a picture. It was as old as the Earth, four and a half billion years and it came to be known as the Genesis Rock. Now how would scientists know that the Earth and the Genesis Rock are the same age if we didn't have terrestrial rocks of similar age to compare the Genesis Rock to? Webb of course excluded this clip in his video, evidently so he could imply that I did not cover this topic. Can you say fallacy of omission? Can you say straw man? I can. This is one of the many reasons why I do not believe that Webb believes his own hype. Some of Webb's adoring fans evidently thought that he was being fair dinkum and blindly bought all his crap about me. They went into the comments gloating about how I allegedly made no attempt to explain the ages of moon rocks, alleging that it would have supposedly been a stumbling block to creating fake moon rocks. Webb made no attempt to hose down these wrong interpretations and instead encouraged and flogged them. He adamantly denied that I discussed the age of moon rocks at all, said I considered it a boogeyman that I pretend doesn't exist by closing my eyes. Dare I say it again, Phil Webb is outright lying to his audiences. Webb also makes a big deal about the cosmic ray exposure found in the Apollo samples. According to papers that were presented at the Second Lunar Science Conference in 1971, the exposure age of one sample was on the order of 67 million years, and another sample was estimated through cross-sectioning to be between 63 million years at the top surface due to solar flares, and 144 million years deeper into the rock, thanks to super-penetrating cosmic rays. And the Neon 21 and Argon 38 tests gave similar ages. Yet in one of his later videos, he admits that the cosmic ray exposure ages for Apollo samples are the same as those found in meteorites. They had cosmic ray exposure ages as old as ancient meteorites, known to originate from deep space. Of all the meteorites Webb could have compared the Apollo samples with, he chose the one class of meteorite that all geologists agree have a completely different composition to the Apollo samples and terrestrial rocks, and totally ignored eukrites and howardites. Meteorites that do share the same compositions as Apollo samples, and likewise have the same exposure ages as Apollo samples. So this entire segment by Phil Webb is just a complete red herring. Yeah, I can flash pictures of attractive girls in my videos too, but I'll take brains over boobs any day.